Hey SBA, my name's Isha and I'm from Parsers, our school's anti-racism and multicultural council. I'm Patrick and I'm from Student Council. Today, we want to speak to you about the Indian Act. So just to note, the term Indian in the Indian Act refers to indigenous peoples and specifically the First Nations, though you should never call an indigenous person an Indian. An actual Indian person is a person who originally came from India, a country in Asia. So what's the Indian Act? Good question. The Indian Act was an act created by the government in 1876, which served to assimilate indigenous peoples, specifically First Nations peoples, into mainstream European Canadian culture. The act set out to do this in many ways. The first thing the Indian Act introduced was the concept of an Indian status. The Indian status was intended as a transitionary period during a First Nations complete assimilation. Originally, anyone was considered an Indian if they were, quote, of Indian blood, end quote, or were part of a, quote, body of Indians, end quote. This also included descendants and people who married those who were already Indian. The government wanted First Nations to exchange their status and ethnicity for rights and land, but almost no Indigenous person volunteered for this. The government made it harder for a person to keep their status as an Indian and the rights and benefits associated with it. In 1951, the government changed the requirements needed to have an Indian status and made it so that a person had to register for the status. However, there were many fine print terms to the status and it was easily lost. Later, several attempts were made by the government to erase Indian status. Losing their status meant losing rights and not being able to receive services and benefits they deserved and needed. In 1969, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau and his Minister of Indian Affairs, Jean Chrétien, unveiled a policy paper that proposed eliminating the consideration of Indigenous peoples as a group and ending the special legal relationship between Indigenous peoples and the Canadian state. This was called the White Paper, and it was heavily opposed as it would get rid of the benefits that status Indians are entitled to, such as rights to education, hunting, health care, land usage, and economic services on reserves. It was a poor and misinformed attempt at establishing equality in Canada and was met with resounding disapproval. The second thing the Indian Act did was create a dependency on the Department of Indian Affairs. The government used officials called Indian agents to control the First Nations identity, method of governance, cultural practices, and right to education. These agents determined the rights and benefits a person was entitled to, often by wholly subjective methods. All complaints an Indigenous person might have had for the government had to be sent through an Indian agent though Indian agents could close their eyes to these complaints without being prosecuted. Indigenous peoples could not complain about their agents either, as that complaint would have to be delivered to the agent first. The department and its agents provided an impassable wall between Indigenous peoples and the government. But what did the act do over time? That's what I'll be discussing now. To begin, as the act was meant to assimilate Indigenous peoples, it first had to remove Indigenous culture and religion. So in 1884, the act decreed that it was now illegal to practice religious ceremonies and celebrations, such as potlatch, a type of gift-giving and wealth redistribution ceremony. This restriction became stricter in the coming years. In 1914, the government made dancing off-reserve illegal, and in 1925, made dancing completely illegal so that the First Nations peoples could no longer dance for celebrations such as powwows and sun dances. The Indian Act's impact on First Nations people grew stronger when in 1911 an amendment called the Oliver Act was introduced. This amendment, named after Frank Oliver, the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs at that time, gave towns and cities which were more populous than neighboring reserves the power to move indigenous peoples off sought after land and off of their reserves without their consent. This meant that First Nations people could be displaced from their homes at any given time without even a say in the matter, regardless of any previous treaties or promises that the government made with them. The government also ensured that no First Nations peoples could speak out by making it illegal for them to hire lawyers or dispute a land claim without getting the government's approval first in 1927. Effectively, this silenced any possible protest, and it was the brutal robbery of land from the First Nations people. In 1894 and 1920, the government made it mandatory that First Nations children had to attend a residential school. Residential schools were government-funded religious schools supported by many Christian churches that were meant to convert Indigenous youth into European-Canadian culture, making them hate their language, their culture, their skin, even their own families. The effects of these schools have been referred to as a cultural genocide, as their intended purpose was to, quote, to kill the Indian in the child, end quote. 
An estimated 6,000 children died at residential schools due to the inhuman conditions, alongside physical and sexual abuse. The documentation of their deaths were poor and often non-existent. Children were not allowed to speak their first language or write home. From the 1940s to 1950s, certain residential schools allowed experimentation on Indigenous children without a parent's consent or knowledge. Officials from what is now Health Canada researched nutrition by starving their students, denying them access to health care, and putting them on extreme diets. The effects of residential schools are felt to this day through many Indigenous peoples, and the last residential school only closed in 1996, less than 25 years ago. Residential schools were not the end. In fact, for children, it was only the beginning. The Canadian government started to realize that residential schools were not as effective as they had previously thought. And in 1958, it was even recommended that residential schools should be removed. Though they still continue to exist, the number of residential schools diminished, and it was instead replaced by tighter restrictions on Indigenous children in the Indian Act. From the 1960s to the 1980s, the Canadian government created an adoption center for First Nations children to be relocated to Caucasian Canadian families. The adoptive family was told that the child was in need of real aid, though in reality, many of these children were forcibly taken from their biological Indigenous parents. In 1951, as a result of Indigenous contributions during the Second World War, some good changes were made to the Indian Act. For one, Indigenous peoples could vote, could now practice their religion through celebrations such as potlatch, had legal rights to land, and even women could now vote in their own elections. Since then, progressive changes have been made, but there's still much to be done. Though the Indian Act is still being revised to this day, it is impossible to ignore the effects that it had on First Nations people for over a century. The Indian Act allowed First Nations to suffer in silence and perpetuated a worsening crisis. In the future, Canada has to embrace the mistakes of the past and must focus on serious reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and the government.